Welcome to the Pixel Retentive Podcast, where we, a business owner and an artist, discuss the business of art and the art of business. Hey friends, I'm Carl, founder of Epic Made. And I am Lisa, founder of Quantius, and we are today's hosts for the Pixel Retentive Podcast, where we share our thoughts on creativity, art, and business. Past guests include Tim Harris, CEO of Paragon, a new NFT management platform, Adam Martin, co-founder of Macroverse, and Linda Yuan, uh, co-founder of Modio. We are forever grateful for the supporters of our podcast and are always looking for more sponsors. That said, today, Pixel Retentive is brought to you by both Epic Made and Quantius. Epic Made is a team of artists and strategists with a mastery of visual storytelling. Our studio makes unforgettable animation and graphic illustration infused with ideas that put money in your pocket. We best serve marketers and brands seeking to engage nerdy millennials, and some of our favorite clients include Nickelodeon, WWE, and Sci-Fi. And Quantius is a mighty team of creative, resourceful product marketers making an impact with some of the biggest brands in the tech industry. Um, and actually today I'm in the meta offices, which is one of our clients. Um, and our clients often refer to us as their secret weapon, um, uh, because we're a nimble agency with the know-how to craft a successful strategy. And then we put together the right fit team to deliver results. Well, thank you for co-hosting with me today, Lisa. I really appreciate you. And, uh, today with us, we have Justin Alanis. Did I get it? There we go. Let's try. <laughs> uh, Justin is a co-founder of StoryCo, an open storytelling platform that enables storytellers to easily create and publish multimedia stories, engage and build a fan base, and build these stories into expansive universes, leveraging the creative powers and ideas of their community. And Justin is an experienced entrepreneur with a background in both technology and private equity. Uh, he currently serves as a core community member at several decentralized organizations that support, invest in, and foster the growth of emerging Web3 technology companies. Thank you so much for joining us today, Justin. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. You sound like a busy man doing cool things. So we're, we're excited to get into the chat with you. So, Yeah, uh, it's, in it's always interesting uh, doing a lot of things, but I tell you, these days, uh, about a hundred percent of my focus is going into Storyco, so that's that's really uh, where my attention is. Other than my family, I suppose. Oh, right. love it, love it. Got to have that prioritization. Family comes first. We all have to always keep that in mind. Happiness, <laughs> health, wellness, all that, and then you dump the whole rest of yourself into business until it starts to pull from those other things. You got to rebalance it. Yeah, especially especially at forty, right? When I was in my twenties and I started my first company. Uh, it was kind of the opposite, but now with kids and uh, I'm 40, like a lot more attention needs to go into my health and my family. No oh problem. my God, bro. Same, same. I've been doing this since 2006 and it's like, I'm religious about my yoga and my running now. Religious. Like you will not catch me missing more than like one or two a week. I've got to get it at least four, if not five, you know, total. So yeah, I totally get it. All right. So long, long, the long haul, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. It's a marathon. I was just talking to one of my engineers today and said, uh, he's like, I had a bad, I had an unproductive week the other week. And I was like, it happens. I have unproductive weeks all the time. And I look at it as an opportunity to refresh and get ready for the next leg of the race. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And so you have to treat it that way. And you have to, you have to be like an endurance athlete in, uh, in, in, in this entrepreneurial game. Without a doubt. Yeah. And often when you have those unproductive weeks, it's because something's a little off that you need to dial in have that little bit of introspective like hey what that didn't just happen on accident like something's mm -hmm. off let's evaluate so yep. yep love it love it well it sounds like we're all cut from the same cloth friends this will be fun all right so before we jump into today's topic we want our audience to get to know you a little bit better so tell us how long you've been in your industry and the projects you're most proud of yeah amazing um so i actually got my start in real estate private equity and i saw a need for a tech uh, a piece of technology that i built i started the company in 2013 i was living in san francisco and uh it was a company called rentlytics and i grew that for about six years grew the team to about 70 people and we were acquired by a publicly traded company in 2018 and so that was my foray into the the world of technology, building uh, sophisticated systems uh, and teams uh, and scaling those teams. 
And that taught me a lot. That's probably the thing I'm most proud of because it just, it, we talked about being an endurance athlete. That company required me to be an endurance athlete. There's just no doubt about it. And I got my firsthand lesson in what it means to be an entrepreneur and a startup founder. Uh, it was at that point that I jumped into the world of Web3. Uh, I got super into it just as a result of really my cousin. Uh, he's a founder in the space, a very successful founder in the space. And I started to dive in. I, I joined a couple of different investing uh, DAOs, decentralized organizations. Yep. And I started to meet founders and and uh, it, who are building in the space and building for the long term and started to really understand the underlying ethos of what the space represented of, of new ownership models, new access models, uh, n- new transparency models um, that exist out there or that are that are being delivered by this set of entrepreneurs. And I just got really deep into the space and started really believing in the future of this technology. Uh, and it was around that time that I pinged my brother, uh, JP, who's my co-founder in StoryCo. And I said, and he had been in the, in the entertainment landscape for uh, his whole career. He had been working with Tyler, the creator, and he had been uh, working for Lionsgate, development executive. And he, so he had been developing linear TV shows and movies. Uh, and he had seen how broken the Hollywood system is. And it, it was me who came to him and said, the, you've told me how broken the system is. And I've now seen what I think the other side could look like, where people who today can't access this system in any meaningful way uh, and who struggle to get ownership in this system. And it's this very closed, nepotistic, uh, you know, sexist system. <laughs> yeah. uh, how do we change that? And that's how StoryCo was born. Uh, was uh, was through our kind of collective uh, experiences and putting those together and finding those puzzle pieces and and saying this is how we're ultimately going to solve uh, this issue together. And so Storyco was born out of that. So yeah, that's a little bit about my background, a little bit about the genesis of Storyco. Fantastic, man! Uh, exciting background. I love the like collaboration with your brother. I know uh, my brothers are entrepreneurs as well. They're in the restaurant tour space, but. That can be um, a difficult uh, space to do and try to navigate all the complexities of those relationships. So so kudos to you guys for being able to pull that off, which is fantastic. And it sounds like your collective backgrounds have, have come together to make something quite quite impactful. So I'm excited to see you know, what you guys do with this brand. And congrats again. I know you got a, a raise recently this year. Thanks. Um, so that uh, that's always validating to your ideas, right? Like, hey, we got something here that people want to actually invest in, which is like amazing. Absolutely. Right? Okay. Yeah, it's 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 the yin, yin and the yang, right? Where you get some money in the door, you hire a team, you increase burn, but now you've got investors that you got to go and earn a return for, uh, and you've got now a responsibility, a greater responsibility than you had previously. And so uh, we take that responsibility seriously, but at the same time, we're trying to you know navigate our own path and try to build a company that we think will uh, be. Uh, a really interesting company for the next 20, 30 years is kind of the time horizon we're thinking about. Yeah. Wow. Um, for sure. So I, that, that kind of leans into that marathon runner, right? Like we're in this space right now, you know, I'm in the web three space, Lisa's in the web three space. So, you know, uh, er, like people that don't know, like, Oh, web three died. No one talks about NFTs anymore. Where, 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 why are you making stuff? With oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's <all> that <laughs> and it's, it's yeah. so funny, but it's what you said. There's so much, robustness of opportunity for for transparency and for community building and and di- changing the way the culture and the landscape of all this stuff has been done for years that's so much more equitable and transparent it's just beautiful like i love it and you know people just think it's you know jpegs of monkeys you know or eight yeah. like it's like yeah. Yeah, you, you don't get it at all yeah. It's yeah, every, every, to, to lay the groundwork for all of this, you know. Absolutely, and we're still in the early innings. You know, I, I mean, crypto has been through its speculative periods, and the last one was the NFT craze. And what we learned is that these JPEGs can act as a catalyst to create community, but you're never going to f- see probably a JPEG company uh, being an eight-figure business uh, again ever. Uh, and and that's okay. Like that, that's the natural evolution of of this. But what, what we've seen now is through this bear market is that there are the believers and the non-believers, but ultimately it continues to grow. Mm-hmm. New brands are pouring into the space uh, at a breakneck pace uh, because of the what the underlying technology represents and allows them to do and you, all those things you talked about, Carl. Um, and so we still believe in it and we see the blockchain 
as one piece of, of critical technology that enables us to do what we need to do and change the the face of, of entertainment ultimately. AI is a similar technology. We see spatial computing as a new uh, paradigm technology as well. And so it's really, we're at a really interesting time in kind of the entertainment landscape right now where you've got the strikes going on. You've got kind of what I would consider Hollywood in, in, in shambles, the consolidation, the space has happened in five kind of players' hands. Uh, and, um, and, and right now we've got these technologies that are evolving that are going to allow for new distribution methods, new, um, um, new funding methods, uh, and, and new creative methods and, and allow anybody to really create Hollywood caliber movies. And though that's like a really powerful moment in time. And you've seen that Hollywood has had these kind of disruption events historically that typically happen around distribution and funding with cable, with the internet. Uh, with broadcast television to start with, right? And new companies emerge out of it every single time, right? Out of broadcast, you had ABC, NBC, CBS. Out of cable, you had companies like HBO and kind of all the cable companies that evolved out of that. And then out of the streaming services, you had companies like Netflix and Amazon and, and this massive consolidation happen. And it took away a ton of like creator rights. And this strike is representative now of of the dissatisfaction of the of the space. And so if all of a sudden now new technologies are arriving at just the right time, we think it's like this perfect confluence of, of circumstances to allow for a new paradigm to evolve uh, that allows for uh, new creative influences, new creative voices to emerge. Um, and that's kind of where we want to play. That makes sense. Yeah. And that's it's a fruitful place to be right now, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. And I know, so obviously we are deep in the the subject matter of today's yes, episode, the emerging tech's role of, in the future of, of entertainment. And yeah, it's 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 quite nice that there's something on the horizon that, you know, imagine like you know, just especially like in music, but even and you know, media entertainment for the, um you know, for movies and uh, what, what, what was cinematic media. Um royalties are so complicated and convoluted like my dad was a sag actor right like and he did some stuff with disney and it, nothing like you know a few movies people might know but the long story short of it is like he has no idea ever how what kind of check he's gonna get there's no like real accountability behind all that and being able to track all that's a nightmare it would cost you more money to figure that shit out than it would to actually like no you know, transparency yeah all. exactly right so he still gets checks from Disney for like five bucks, like every couple of months. And he's been dead for seven years. You know what I mean? Like it's like, it's stupid. <laughs> and so the whole system is ridiculous, right? And if it's all automated on a blockchain, like how powerful is that? And how representational? And then you can see like where the money goes. I mean, think about what happens if we apply blockchain technology. I'm going to deviate in a minute. But what if we, what if we use crypto and said you couldn't fund campaigns unless you did it with crypto on a public blockchain? Like, right. oh shit, now we're going to really see where money goes. But that same thing could be said for for the entertainment sector as well, and understanding how all that funnels and moves. It's it's really powerful. Yeah, or or even assigning, um, or even being able to see who owns uh, the pieces of of it, right? Um, Arbit so, attribute, yeah, uh, yeah, there it is. Attribution, yeah, attribution, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and and you know, we just launched a new initiative called Profit Points, um, and we we launched two new initiatives recently. One's called Co Create, and one's called Profit Points. And this goes into a little bit about what we're doing, and I could talk more about more about that, but. Co-create is the opp opportunity for anybody across the world to co-create alongside of our production, where we have these Hollywood actors, Hollywood writers, Hollywood you know Hollywood illustrators coming together to create these new stories. This this new epic franchise called the Disco Ball. It's our first one that to debut on the Storyco platform, and we want the ability for anyone across the world to be able to come in, contribute to this narrative universe, expand it in interesting ways, add color to it in interesting ways. Our first co-create was. Uh, an, an illustrate a set of illustrations that um, we put out there to the world. We got a ton of applications, and we selected a Nigerian artist who goes to school in Nigeria. He's 20 years old. His name's Anu, and this is a guy who probably never would have been able to access the Hollywood industry um, uh, otherwise. And now he's he illustrated these amazing panels for our first story, the Disco Ball, and a backstory that's being voiced by a very famous actor. Uh, that got written by a guy named Kyle Killen, who wrote uh, and directed and produced the Halo series on Paramount Plus, the Fear Street series on Netflix, uh, and and so now this is a guy who's who's now his byline is right next to these big names, 
Um, and that's kind of what we want to empower. And as a result of that, Anu got paid for his work, but he also got underlying profit points in the disco ball. Wow. And we, we as we as StoryCo have given to the community 50% of future profit to of the disco ball to the community. And we are then giving that away to the community based on their participation and their efforts in creating value in this universe. And all of that is being logged on the blockchain so that people have transparency into the ownership rights and who owns what. And all of our cost production costs are being put on the blockchain so everybody can see kind of how the accounting is working. Um, so yeah, you talk about the transparency and attribution and all that, and we're putting that into place in real time. I love it, man. Um, so obviously you've seen how Yuga Labs operates. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I assume you probably know some people over there. Maybe that's your cousin, but um, yeah. <laughs> no, like, not. Okay. Well, they have some, like, I love the, that idea and that idea of how it's proliferating and it, and it becomes, you know, like we want to co-create with each other, right? Like we want to give everybody credit. Like that's the big pivot point that I talk about so much Well, because I do presentations on Web3 a lot, trying to educate, especially other creatives and marketers about like what's coming, right? It's not here yet. We're having, you know, mass adoption not here, but PayPal just dropped a stable coin, right? So PayPal is clearly looking at, I don't okay. know what's, how long is it going to be before PayPal says, hey, you can have your NFTs and your crypto in, our, in your PayPal account. And then boom, we're there. Sure. Everybody has a PayPal account, right? The same thing, you know, with the FedNow program and there's blockchain technology on that. But, you know, I digress on that. But the, the long story, oh man, I just lost my train of thought. Where was it well, going with that? Yeah. I, I think what you're talking about is is with Yuga, it, it's this idea yeah. of the power of this kind of um, cr creative commons um, yeah. where where anybody can now create within this environment. I think the way that Yuga's done it is a little bit backwards where Yuga is a centralized organization and like we're still a centralized organization. We do have a, a desire to become a public good. I don't think Yuga ever wants to become a sure. public good. Um, mm -hmm. They dropped ApeCoin which they drop to kind of their community of holders in order to kind of promote and power this this ecosystem of of builders and also use it as a as an in-game currency for for their own centralized stuff. And so they've done it in a little bit of a different way than we certainly envision it. And what we've also seen is that with the Board Ape Yacht Club community and I'm a Board Ape Yacht Club holder. I'm a I minted an original Board Ape. Um way to be in so, the know at the right time, brother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. I wish I'd minted twenty or that two hundred bucks went a long ways now. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, uh, but there were a lot of other like losses, like you know, minting oh, like yeah. things I'd minted that did <laughs> not pan out. So you know, sure, sure. Uh, you know, it's a roll of the dice. There's no doubt about it. But you know, the board Ape community has some really interesting projects that are evolving out of it. There's like Jenkins the ballet. There's a, a couple others that that are somewhat interesting. But we've kind of seen them all flail a little bit um, because. It, uh, you know, in our mind, it's really hard to create uh, penetration and and something really robust around like a single JPEG. Um, and, and so how do you create, how do you do that? And not everybody who wants to create or is going to create a hamburger restaurant or, uh, you know, who owns a JPEG is going to want to create something off of it. Most people are just going to want to hold it. And so our, our thinking is like a little bit more of like, how does each person in our community add value in different ways to the whole of the community of the uh, to the whole of the project and of the uh, and of the technology you're going to have different people who want to do different things they're going to be you're going to be people who are just fans and like want to be fans of of the story and the franchise and they maybe just want to sit back and and view it you're going to have people who may want to have influence in it so they want to vote on the direction of things they want to help determine the direction of the story and new story franchises that evolve out of it you're going to want to have people who like co-create alongside of it. Right. And, and this add is fiction, probably, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Add, add narrative fiction. Uh, you know, we see this right now in fan fiction and, 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 um, cosplay and, and fan art and like all this creative, um, uh, you know, hive mind that's happening. And it's really interesting out there, but how do we give those people an opportunity to not only add the value, but then, then, then be represented of through ownership and payment for the value that they actually add to the franchise. And that's something that Yuga is not really doing. And so we think that we are taking a bit a bit of a different tack than like a Yuga, for example. And again, like, you know, Yuga's an eight figure business off the back of dropping ten thousand monkeys and, yep. and some mutants. Yep. That that world is gone. But like right. how do you how do you create value and revenue still off of NFTs? We think that world still exists. 
but it's like it, it's a little bit different in terms of the way that you do it. You're not you're not earning royalties anymore because that world is kind of gone. And so, how do you embed those NFTs as a deeper, more embedded part of your infrastructure? Uh, and, and that's kind of how we're thinking about the broader landscape. Yeah, yeah, really infusing that utility is huge. Exactly, and just making yep. sure that it gives community buy-in and ownership and. And as our, our communities evolve to be more and more digital, and people have more and more of a digital presence, you know, it's more and more of a flex for what NFTs you hold, right? Like, I mean, you see that in, uh, like, on the lightest level right now on Twitter, right? Like, you have an official Twitter icon that you hold this NFT, and it's an octagon now. So, like, if you've got a punker at eight, people know you're super legit in the space, and you've either been in here since it was real cheap, or you've got a lot of disposable income, either way you yeah, believe yeah. in it, right? So, like, um, yeah. yeah, fascinating stuff for sure. Yeah, and, and there's... Yeah. There's also this idea of like reputation, right? Where we we believe strongly in this idea of building reputation and and the blockchain can service help service that of like what have you done in other projects? What have you done uh in in our in our community and in our ecosystem and building up your reputation within that and being able to then have that transportable resume that you can bring anywhere is a super powerful new paradigm as well. Uh, but, you know, I think that this is this idea today of like, we talked about it in Hollywood of nepotism and sexism and like all these problems, but like with the blockchain, you can see like, this is what I've done. This work. is how I've, this is how it is. Yeah, this is proof of work where now, you know, like, okay, should I be investing in this person? And, um, and the blockchain can help answer a lot of those questions. Absolutely. You know, the, the metaverse is going to be an interesting, interesting play with all this too, as they, they coalesce a lot. I know Lisa works in the metaverse space a lot too, but so outside of just like that, you know, online profile flex, right? Like, but like when you're, when people are spending more and more time in whatever, you know, whoever wins the metaverse race and hopefully it's different sectors and there's different niches for different it's, things. It's going to be spread around. I really believe it's different community based where it's going to be built out, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. I love it. I love the idea of that. You can own things in there and they're transferable. They have property and they have, you have actual, you know, um, you know, provable ownership, which is where this, this all, and the first NFTs ever created were literally for digital art to create some scarcity. Uh, and I forget the name of the artist off the top of my head, but they, you know, they made them so that they could sell a digital thing for the first time. And, you know, they evolved all the way into like, you know, the peak with the apes where it was, their, it was just cool. They didn't have their plan when they launched yep. those things. You know, no one even knew that it's, this was a cool new thing and early adopters, tech heads that were just like, hey, I like this stuff. This is going to be cool. You got to go like yourself, right? You bought one because it's like, hey, I mean, what was your motivation? I, I, I've never talked to someone that minted an ape. Yeah. What was your motivation on that? Like, uh, I was I was playing around more of the blockchain space and was very new. To, in fact, the board ape was the first ever mint of an NFT I ever did. Uh, and, and so, Whoa. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that, that's how early it was. And yeah. I, I, I would have minted more, but I, I didn't even know how to find it in my wallet. I didn't know how to see it. I was like, where do I go to see this thing? I just minted it. And then like, I remember like a couple months later, I was like, ah, oh, these things are like actually worth some money. Like I should go figure out where this thing went. Like, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, and so what motivated me was like, I was on Twitter one night and I saw Justin Blau, uh, the, 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 the artist. Uh, tweet something about minting on board ape, and I was like, "Fuck it, why not? Um, I'll go do it." And so I minted one, uh, and so that was that was really the motivation. And they had a cool website, and I was like, "Oh, this is kind of interesting, like digital ownership of of art." Uh, yeah, cool, like this generative NFT where I can get different traits and rarities and things like that. Like this is kind of new and and super interesting. Um, and so that did was motivation. Did funding or anything to start with, or did they did they just like? Bootstrap. As far as I know, they didn't. They bootstrapped the whole thing. They hired an artist, or, or yeah, I think they paid the artist. And then it, like, it, it was actually the mint window had been open, I think, for like three days, and they hadn't minted any. And then a couple people caught on to it and tweeted about it. And then overnight, the, the same night I minted, by the next morning, I was like, oh shit, everybody's talking about this thing. I'm gonna go mint more. And it was all sold out at that well, point. Oh, wow. and it happened that and, fast. Yeah. yeah, it happened that fast. And then all of a sudden it just, it, it, it hit like wildfire. And it's like a really interesting, you know, case study in how, you know, the hive mind and, and just all of a sudden, um, you know, if people pick up on something, how things operate and work in that way. And if you, especially if you have scarcity in that asset. Right. Well, um, speaking of funding, since you just got funded, how, how did that come about for you? Did you um, see that as part of your trajectory from the beginning? Or um, is that something you saw as a necessity to grow? We had always seen it as part of uh, 
the trajectory of what we needed to do. You know, we're building quite a bit of technology. We need a big team to do that. We're, uh, you know, what we're building is the ability to basically turn a script. So, uh, a, 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 you know, like you'd see in Hollywood, a TV script, a movie script into a, uh, a scrolling, uh, 3d animated experience, um, automatically. You're right? not gonna and, and, that. <laughs> yeah, 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 and, and then and then to and then to build a network, a creative network to enable that story to then to flourish. So if you're a writer, you might need an, uh, an illustrator, you might need a 3D developer, you might need a um, uh, might need a sound effects person. And so we're doing this in a way in which uh, you can connect with other people who are out there, share ownership in that that underlying story, and then give uh, underlying profit points uh, away to your community of fans. Because we just like fundamentally believe in this like collapse of creator and fan, and that the creators b- become fans, fans become creators, and th- there's like very little separation between the two, and it's shrinking more and more by the day. And so, in order to build this robust network, in order to build all the technology we needed, in order to build this production out, because we're we're basically the the disc the disco ball is our first production. We're doing it ourselves because we wanted to show what the potential of what we're building can 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 power. Uh, it's like the first test of what we can do. And then we're opening up all these tools to our community over time to build new stories themselves and to also have more of our own productions on the platform, like these premium productions. And so what we needed to do costs just cost some money. Um, and so we needed to, we needed to raise from the outset and we have just amazing investors who are super supportive of our vision. Uh, and we're, we're fortunate for that. That's great. Yeah. And, um, so your timeline as far as you've got this first big production and um, when are you have it open now for people creatives to come in and um, participate right now or is that something that we do yeah we do in in limited quantity right now but it's crazy we've we've opened up five co-create opportunities so far we're about to open up another 10 and so far we've had i think like 300 different creatives come in whether it's writing we've we've opened up writing music illustration um, uh, uh, some logo designs, things like that, that are, that all kind of add to the, to the universe mm-hmm. and people have come in and they've really, oh, and voice acting as well. And people have really like understood like the, 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 the space, what yeah. we're doing, uh, the, the production. And we started the production with a prologue. It's like an ARG. It's a alternative, almost like an alternative reality game, uh, where people, where, where people become part of the story. And they have to solve puzzles and clues, find clues in order to advance the story, uh, and and go to the StoryCo website. We created a fictitious organization named Debris, the Disco Ball Research and Investigative Society, uh, and yeah, and and it's it, the the story is about the multiverse, and Debris is an organization in our universe or in all in our kind of segment of the universe that that believes in the multiverse, but they haven't proven it yet, and so they're looking for clues to prove out that there's a multiverse out there. It's kind of drafted off of MUFON, if you guys have ever seen MUFON, which is the organization that believes in UFOs and has done a lot of research and studies into UFOs. And um, and so the idea here is that the community can become more of an interactive part of, of this narrative and actually help the characters in our story advance the narrative. Uh, and so we started with a prologue and now we're launching the main narrative uh, within the next couple of weeks, which is very exciting. By the time this comes out, it'll probably already be out. Check it yeah. out on story.co, yeah, forward slash disco ball. Fantastic. Awesome, awesome. I'm going to clue my niece into this. My poor, just, she just graduated in uh, screenwriting this year. Yeah. And Amazing. Moved to LA, immediately strike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so it's such she, a difficult you know, road. Like we talk about this all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Even without the strike, it's difficult. Bro, you got like get into a writer's room. Then yep. like maybe the show gets canceled. You have like your own your your own script that you might want to get. Maybe it gets picked up if you're really lucky. And then maybe it gets greenlit for a little while. And then it gets it, then it gets cl- shut down because some executive doesn't fit within their agenda anymore, uh, or budget yeah. anymore. It's yeah. like it's a crazy process. And so uh, yeah, tell your niece also that we've got um, these learning opportunities within Storyco. Join our Discord. And she can, uh, they're called collabs. And we've got this amazing screenwriter named Julia Yorks coming on uh, next week. Uh, it'll probably be past that time by the time this is out here, but um, we've yeah. got amazing illustrators and writers and voice actors. And this is an opportunity for people to come into our ecosystem and learn how to be a writer, how to write amazing screenplays, how to be an illustrator, how to think about 
um, uh, doing voiceover talent, voiceover acting, things like that, where we don't just want to give opportunities from to then create and add to our universes, but also just hone their craft in general. That's fantastic. It really is. So I'm curious. So when on the VC side of this, if you were, when you pitched them, like, did you have all of this already put together in terms of like, this was the roadmap or like, is this like the buy-in for them? Like, I think some of our audience might be interested in understanding how yeah. that works a little more. Yeah. Um, early, early on, we, we, like, I look back at our old decks. I'm like, wow, we didn't know a lot. You know, um, of course you, you try to paint what in your mind's eyes is going to look like, but it, it, in society nowadays, whether you're building an AI or web three or, or just in tech, things are changing at a breakneck pace, right? We it, it, Technology is advancing at almost exponential rates at this point. And one of the things that we've learned is that you need to adapt to your environment uh, rather quickly. And so you need to be flexible in, in the direction that you're heading. And if you're stubborn with the direction that you're headed, you're likely to run into just like continual roadblocks. And so for us, it's been a constant evolution of adapting to the community, the community needs, uh, to, uh, to 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 what we're hearing from people, to what's happening in the industry, what's happening with regulation, what's happening with you know NFTs, what's happening yeah. with the ability to fund, like all of those things impact the direction that you go with any business. And so we've had to we've had to adapt in real time quite a bit. And I think that's the journey of any entrepreneur. You can spin a, a fanciful tale of where this goes. And I think at the end of the day, in 20, 30 years, we still want it to represent what we wanted it to represent back then, or we want it to be what, what we told people it would be. But the road and the path to get there is constantly changing. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to be able to adapt as you go. Right? And that that's the beauty of us nimble, smaller organizations. That, you know, we can do that without toppling the massive cargo carrier of whatever the hell we've been hauling, like these big age. You know, and you see all these big brands jumping into the space, but they're all just throwing money at experimental things with no expectations of ROI, uh, really just brand experiential things, um, which has been interesting to me because that that to me said, says a lot about the space as well. That, you know, when the big brands are buying in, they, you know, they, they think there's something here that they don't want to miss, but even if they don't really know what they're doing with it because they're not dialing wanna, into it. They want to have their brand in there yeah. somehow. They want to get their logo yeah. in there. They don't that's really why they need. That's why they need good people like you, uh, Lisa, right, to help them understand uh, where it is that they should be playing in this space. And I think a lot of brands have gotten it wrong. Um, you know, they, they've they've gone into these more speculative, like drop an NFT and do nothing with it. But there's some brands that have gotten it right, where it's like, no, this is about creating community. This is about getting close to your customers. This is about creating brand loyalty. Um, and, and if you approach it more from that direction rather than just making a buck, uh, it can be a really powerful, it can be very, very powerful for that brand. Yeah, I, I've never seen anything that could be more powerful than the level of community involvement and just deep value you can give back to your customer with these w with this type of technology. That's like when I saw it the first time, I, 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 Gary V really put it on my radar. Uh, you know, and then I had some friends come and talk to me about it as well on the side about different art parts of it. And, but like, it's just like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. Uh, and then like, for me, like I, I have a little pet project, right? I have no, like, I don't want to, I don't even care if I ever make money with it. It's fun. It's exciting. But like, I've taken all of my dad's art. Uh, he died in 2016 and I've minted them all to the blockchain a little bit at a time. And each awesome. one in the metadata, I put little stories about them and talk about them and like, you know, so it's permanently immortalized, like this crazy, ridiculous artist from New York and all this amazing art he made. And, you know, maybe it'll catch on in 100 years or 200 years or, or maybe while I'm alive. But like the idea that like it's not going to die with me or the last person that knew him that cared about his art. There's something cool there. There's something immortal. 100%. There. Like just beautiful. Yeah. And I love it. You know, 100 percent. I think I think it, it might catch on. It might not. But what is interesting about it is that if you put it on Facebook. For example, like there's a chance that Facebook disappears or deletes the data one day, and it's that it's gone. Thing about putting it on the blockchain is that it will be forever, um, and and now even if it doesn't catch on, your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids, your great 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 grandkids will now be able to go back and look at that and look at the provenance of it and be able to then add to it in interesting ways to say like, well, here's my great 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 grandpa's art. Here's my great grandpa's art. Here's my great great you know like. And like be able to see this lineage yeah. of history kind of throughout time, 
and link it back in all very interesting ways. Yeah, we don't, we don't even know what like how that's going to affect in the future, which is beautiful. I wish we could figure out the royalties thing though, because a part of that that really yeah. intrigued me early on was like all of the, that what you just said. Oh, and there's a financial legacy that can come with these minted these wallets where things were minted from. Um, you know, I didn't understand early on that that was you know largely connected to the exchanges, and obviously what OpenSea just did was pretty disappointing. Um, so, you know. Hopefully we figure out a, a solution to that, and I'm sure we will, because it's that in itself is a powerful thing, you know, doing royalties that way, and especially yeah, when you're yeah. talking about- It's so important. hundred percent. You know, I, I think it was one of the reasons that creators were so attracted to this space early on was because of the royalty where, you know, if you think about what happens today where an artist creates a meaningful piece of art, and then maybe, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I don't know, name a famous artist that died before they reached fame, happens all the time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden their estate sees none of the upside of any of the profits related to the resale and the value of, of that art. And it's there's there's something really nice about being able to have that forever stream of income based on the artistic your artistic expression. And especially if it reaches mainstream value. Yeah. Uh, You're getting compensated and, for your cultural impact on society. It's yeah. 100%. And it's important with the, with AI now to capture all the value you can from that human creation. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Unfortunately, crypto today is like still too speculatively driven. Um, and there's, I think there's room for speculators in any marketplace clearly, right? Like it's, it's the reason we have these boom bust cycles. And during these boom cycles, a lot of consolidation happens. A lot of innovation happens. A lot of funding happens that allows like the innovation to continue during the bear cycles. But, um, you know, the fact that they've gotten rid of, of royalties, most exchanges blur and open sea, uh, it signals to me that they're catering more to speculators than they are to like real enthusiasts of the art yeah. uh, and to and to creators, and that's like a that's not a great place for the industry to be. And so uh, I'm I'm also hoping that there's some fundamental changes that happen as a result of it. There's some creators out there with our similar mindsets that'll make it happen yes. some way. And you're sure. yeah, I'm and sure. you're moving the industry in the right direction. So. Yeah, and the fact that we keep having these conversations, right? Like we're steering this conversation. That's yeah, right. That's, that's right. huge. So, you know, I, and I do this, you know, on the Graphic Artist Guild board. I'm on the national right. board there too. And mm -hmm. I advocate for this all the time. And this was my huge thing uh, mm -hmm. when I got on there. So when I saw that OpenSea made that decision, I was really disappointed. I did not know Blur had done that as well. There's, they're making these optional now? Yeah, Blur was kind of the the um, the the first to do it, and it was it was one of the reasons why there's this race to the bottom was because Blur is this more of an aggregator site where they're they're really catering to um, to speculators who are buying multiple NFTs at one time, and so their their whole incentive was let's let's like let's let's lower the barrier here for these speculators to be able to trade these things, mm -hmm. um, and and it and it created this a bit of a race to the bottom where now. Every Magic Eden announced it, and then I think they reversed it, and I don't know where they are right now. Um, Open C obviously then kind of was was holding firm for a while, and they reversed it. And so, um, I, because Blur all of a sudden is doing this, and they're earning market share, and the market is speaking, the market is saying this is what we as speculators want. Yeah. But what I I think like the the long term outcome of this is like everything is declining to zero because now all of a sudden. Uh, there's just like people don't see the value in doing this anymore. Yeah, why would you? Do that? Yeah, and unfortunately, the community, the people that love this tech, and the the people that would benefit most from that, aren't the ones holding the most of the money, and aren't the ones influencing how they are, you know, doing in the marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. So, and like I didn't, I never even heard of Blur till they overtook OpenSea and, and traded volume, which I was like, who the hell is this? Like OpenSea was so far ahead of everyone, and yeah. then they just came out of nowhere, which was crazy. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting to even think about. Well, I hate to interrupt this uh, conversation, but we are coming up on time. Yeah. Wow. So uh, that happened really fast. <laughs> but before we wrap up, um, we do have one last question for you. Um, yeah. Is anyone or anything in your career that you would like to shout out to the audience? Maybe a mentor, a valuable, valuable resource or uh yeah, yeah sure. there's a couple, couple people, I think. Um, uh, I think, well, first, I, I got to recognize my brother. Um, uh, Carl, you talked about it earlier. Uh, it's been uh, it's been super amazing to work with my brother uh, on this. It's uh, it's brought us closer together. Uh, you know, we, we live, I live up in Northern California, he lives in Southern California. And just being able to see one another 
uh, at holidays is one thing, but being able to now see each other every single day and work to get, work with one another and, and speak with one another every day has been amazing. And he's just like this creative force behind the business that it's been uh, awesome to watch him work. Uh, the second person is uh, a person who I got I got together with early on in the Web3 space. His name is Gordon Gould. Uh, he's an amazing entrepreneur out of Santa Monica. He and his wife uh, started a, a, a really amazing uh, vitamin, gummy vitamin company uh, back in the day. Uh, sold it for a lot of money. And now he's been in the Web3 space building a new climate tech initiative that I helped with them. I helped them with early on. I'm an advisor to them now. Uh, and it's just like this really, really amazing company called New Atlantis that they're doing some uh, really cool uh, work uh, to help impact the planet and using more transparent methods to to help uh, solve climate change. And then the last person is the person who gave me my first check for uh, Rentlytics. It was the, my my entrepreneurial, you know, started my entrepreneurial journey. Guy at Trinity Ventures named Noel Fenton. Uh, Noel is the father of Peter Fenton, uh, the legendary, famous VC from Benchmark. Yeah. Noel started Trinity Ventures, and he was one of the OG kind of Silicon Valley guys, just one of the most amazing people I've ever met, super supportive of me and my journey, wrote me my first check ever, got me started. And that's like one of those moments that you just never forget. Yeah, yeah without a doubt. Well, beautiful. Thanks for sharing all that love, man. Those people uh, are obviously amazing influences on your life. And yeah, dude, shout out again to just like, being able to do things with your brother, like that's really cool. I know, and I, I help my brothers with their brands and stuff. But we have separate businesses, but I build all their beautiful assets and make sure they, you know, they make their millions. So <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Man. Um. Cool. All right. Well, we've been talking to Justin Alanis, uh, who is the co-founder of StoryCo. You can check out their website at story.co. But if listeners want to follow up you with you directly, where should they go? Uh, they can hit me up on Twitter. It's uh, at StoryCode Justin and shoot me a DM uh, and love to love to hear from you. Awesome. Fantastic. She has to. All right. All right, Justin. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. And thanks, Carl. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. And until next time, friends, we'll talk to you. Right. Take care. We really hope you enjoyed the show. Please like and subscribe to join us on our next journey through the world of art and business on the Pixel Retentive Podcast. (laughs) 